Hello, I'm Tiffany Cloud. Welcome to a special 30-minute commercial-free political edition of The Storm. I am joined today by Matt Connolly, who is running for Congress in the 17th Congressional District as a Republican. Thank you so much for joining me today, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here, Tiffany. I appreciate you coming out on this uh, rainy evening that we're taping up to Hazleton. Um, I'm really excited about this race. So. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, well, I want to hear all about the race and all about your platforms. But before we dive into that, I want to make sure the audience has an opportunity to get to know you a bit. So. Okay. If you could sort of tell everybody a little bit about the man, Matt Connolly. Okay, uh, 48 years old, uh, for the last 25 years, made my living in professional auto racing, something I've wanted to do since I was six years old, you know, American dream. Mm -hmm. uh, family vacation, we were driving to a car museum. It was just on the way to Rhode Island, okay. and my parents wanted to stop. My brother and sister and I were in the back of the old Plymouth Fury wagon, <laughs> and, and there was this little Bugatti, uh, like from the 20s, in this museum. And I remember looking at that car and thinking, if I could drive something like that, I would be the happiest person ever. And it's funny how those little seminal things in your life come along and it gives you purpose. Mm -hmm. And it also turns out that I have a little bit of heritage. My grandfather was Eddie Rickenbacker's ride-along mechanic in the Indy races in the 20s. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, oh, so, so it's in the blood. A little bit. I think it skips a generation. but uh, Well, it'll be very interesting uh, for someone who's used <clears throat> to going at very fast speeds. Uh, should you uh, be elected to Congress? When I'm elected to Congress, Absolutely. Tiffany, there you go. I love get, the confidence. Let's get it right. I, I expect anybody who gets behind uh, a car at your speeds to have confidence, you and must, I'm yes, glad. Yes. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how one that's used to going as quickly as you go in that side of your life to uh, deal with how the pace at which things move well, in Washington. Auto racing is kind of funny. What people see on television uh, is very different than the behind the scenes. It's like 1% action, 99% tedium, drudgery, and, and you know, and tenseness, so to okay. speak. Yeah, it's a, lot, it's a lot of preparation. It's not like we put the car in the garage and then take it back out for the next race. The car gets back to the shop, totally disassembled, totally rebuilt for the next race, and it shows up looking like it did almost when it left last time, but all new inside. So it's, okay. it's a lot of work. It's a lot of planning, a lot of development. You're always doing something. Okay. Well, actually, that may be a very good parallel then it, for it running. Is. It yeah, really it's, is. Yeah. So why did you decide? Was there a moment? Was there a conversation you had, an event? What made you decide to run for Congress? In 1992, I started getting politically involved. It's when I really saw, okay, Reagan, my father lost his business in the Carter years. And I remember 22% interest rates. I didn't really know what they meant because I was still kind of a kid, but I knew it was bad. And I remember everyone just complaining about why things aren't moving, what happened. Ronald Reagan shows up and it just begins to slowly take off. It wasn't like a rocket, but it just began to take off and it seemed like it never stopped. And I sort of had my coming of age in the Reagan years. He was the first person I got to vote for in the second term. H.W. Uh, Bush comes in, pretty much keeps it going. And then I saw, okay, I, I started to get a little more politically aware of things. And I voted for Ross Perot. I, I thought, here's a guy, a business guy. He wasn't part of either one of the parties. You know, I thought he would be untouchable, that kind of thing. Of course, he didn't turn out to be the most stable guy. Um, well, I, I put mm -hmm. that, you know, you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Um, so with that, I really got a taste of it, and I really began to follow it. Um, the big moment was 2000, because I thought President Gore would be, would be horrifying. Yes. It, and, and the fact that he won the popular vote only gives me more credibility in the electoral system because if he if he had the, if the popular vote had done it, mm -hmm. then all the flyover country, all those middle red states would have been completely irrelevant, and that's not sure. what this country was based on. Agreed, agreed. But to continue on with the political thing, I really started to study the issues, mm -hmm. um, the balances of power, the Constitution, things like that, and I realized how brilliant the founding fathers had it. Mm -hmm. It was uh, it was almost divinely inspired. Um, it was it was a convergence of people, their experiences, their intellect. And, and it's something else that I've never seen, I don't think the world has ever seen, that, that made this country the origins as it was. Um, then if you look at the path we had, it's just funny, just today uh, they've said that China, within this year, might exceed the, the size of the economy of the United States. They were predicting that 2018, maybe 2028. Sure. The United States took over in 1872 was when it began to surpass Great Britain as, as the dominant economic force in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a 142-year run we have going here. And we had someone elected in 2008 as president who said he was going to fundamentally transform this nation. Boy, was he right. Yes. And I would say that the voters didn't know what he meant. 
Some of the voters well, did. I like to think I did. <laughs> no, no, I mean yes. the vote. Right, exactly. Right, but yes, the, the, it's scary. Yeah. The transformation, when something's been successful and we've had such right, a good right, run to your right, point, right. did we need a transformation? No, no. We have a guy who doesn't like this country. We, we have, we, if you look at China, still a communist country, becoming rapidly capitalistic, and the growth is amazing. We have the United States, capitalistic, becoming socialistic under this administration. Look at the shrinkage. Growth last quarter, 0.1 percent. Mm -hmm. That's and the only reason it's more than zero was because of the uh, government spending on Obamacare. Well, and it's interesting because I, I definitely want to talk about Obamacare a lot. But the person that presently holds the seat in the 17th congressional district, uh, Congressman Matt Cartwright, I've interviewed him in the past before he was a congressman. He's voted very much in lockstep with the Obama administration's I think, policies. I think Barack Obama and Matt Cartwright were twins separated at birth. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are parallels. And, and you know, he says Obamacare didn't go far enough. Didn't go far enough. He said it on my show. I sort it's of thought, how much further can it go? Yeah, it, it can go single-payer socialist medicine. That's exactly, exactly what it can. Because he, he's, he's basically a Canadian at heart. He was raised in Canada, went to Oxford, England for college. That's where he met his wife, came back, that sort of thing. So he is not an American in the sense of the American values that we have. Mm -hmm. He's a guy who thinks that we should do it like the other countries do. Now, we all know, if you want a great example of what the Obamacare moving to the next level is, look at the Veterans Administration. You remember, the, remember the thing in, in Phoenix? I'm acutely aware of what's going in the Veterans Administration. Forty people died because died of lack of waiting. coverage. Waiting. Now, waiting. But on paper, they didn't because no. the woman got a bonus for keeping her schedule properly, you know, 20 days for an appointment. That, that is a perfect example of what we'll, we will see should Obamacare ever become more than it is. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the old thing, you get diagnosed when you're curable, you're treated when you're incurable. Why do you think Canadians come down to the United States for, for treatment? Because they die waiting over there. It's, mm -hmm. it's, why can't we see this? So if you were elected, uh, when, when you're elected, okay, there we go. Well, I don't want to seem too biased as the media person right now, but when you're elected, um, to use your, your words, uh, would you be working to repeal Obamacare? What is your intent? In the only thing you can do is defund repeal it. Okay. Repeal it. No, mm -hmm. not defund it. it you got to realize, because it's a law, mm -hmm. it's, it's got a lot of fingers. It's, it's going into a lot of places. Mm -hmm. You have to repeal it. And it's going to be expensive to pull it all back out of the crevices and all those kind of things. But so what? You know, they, they repealed prohibition. They repealed lots of things. And, re and prohibition was an amendment. Mm -hmm. This is just the law. Well, listen, and this <clears> law <throat> has caused over 5 million people who had health coverage that they were very happy I'm about. I'm one of those. I lost you my lost, health. You I lost, lost yours. It. And I do not have any currently because it's a 300% uh, difference between what I was paying and what I You're would have to them. pay. And my deductible went from three thousand to eight thousand dollars. So basically, oh. what it means is, you don't. If, if you have to pay more than, let's say, let's say you have to pay six thousand dollars a year for your premiums under Obamacare, five hundred bucks a month, and your eight eight thousand dollar premium, I mean deductible, mm -hmm. that's thirteen thousand, uh, fourteen thousand dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, you don't have health care coverage at that point. Because unless you're in some catastrophic accident or get some horrible disease, everything you pay is going to pay out of your pocket because you're never going to meet your deductible. What is the point of that? Right. It's interesting that it's touched you personally. That's very interesting. Because I've met a few people now, yeah. which is scary. You're going to meet a lot more. Yeah, well, uh, exactly. <laughs> I know we could do an entire show on Obamacare right, and right. all the problems with right. it, and I don't, uh, believe me, I wish we could go on and on, but we have a half an hour. I want to spend some time, as you were talking about China surpassing us and the projections for that to occur. I mean, one of the things I know that is important to you is for us to be energy self-sufficient, not necessarily reliant so much on foreign governments, many of whom don't like us very much, for oil. We send $800 billion a year to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. You know, how many gold-plated Cadillacs do they really need? But they're happy to give it to us. And it's funny, the environmentalists are okay with them taking it out of the ground here, but they're not okay with us taking it out of the ground here, which, which is really sort of fascinating. It really lets you know that it's not about the oil. It's about anti-capitalism. Mm -hmm. Now, some of them are under the false belief that you can get all of your energy needs from solar and wind. It's impossible. Or that you can grow it. Um, biomass or biofuels or ethanol. People don't realize that if the government didn't uh, subsidize ethanol, it'd be four bucks a gallon, just for the ethanol. It takes seven tenths of a gallon of gasoline to make one gallon of ethanol, and that's before it gets transported anywhere. It, it's, why do you think corn prices are going up? Bread prices, everything that's dependent on that, on that meal is gone up because we're using it for fuel when we can get it out of the ground and it's been there for billions of years waiting for us well and in the state of pennsylvania a state that you would be representing 
Um, natural gas is under our feet. We, we have 80%, I believe, of our energy in the state is fired by coal, an industry that this right. administration right. via the EPA is, is trying to Shut destroy. Down. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so that's ex extremely concerning. I, I'm not against changing the coal-fired things to natural gas. That's mm -hmm. okay because it, it, it's, natural gas is simpler. Uh, it's, it does pollute less. Um, it, it's a lot easier fuel to work with. You can liquefy the coal or you could ship the coal. Let's export the coal. It's easier to export coal than it is to export natural gas because okay. you've got to liquefy natural gas, which is a whole different process. But, but uh, exporting coal is the way to go. Other countries need it. They can take our developing uh, factories and things like that that were coal-fired, coal -fired, coal-powered plants, things like that, and they can use them and start off there. We can then transform and transition to natural gas. And I think nuclear is another big one because sure. nuclear has zero carbon footprint if you pay attention to that kind of thing. I am not a global warming person. I do not believe it exists. I don't believe it's man-made. I think we are such a tiny little speck. That we're, not, we're not changing the weather patterns. Mm -hmm. That's just the way that the liberals use guilt and fear to try to control our behavior. I mean, why, there's never been a point where gasoline, where oil, for example, as a commodity, has ever been truly impacted its price by supply and demand. It's always been either political manipulation or market manipulation. Well, the other thing we have to think about, in addition to the economic ramifications of us being dependent upon these other countries that hate, hate us, there are ramifications in terms of national security. You know, we've been seeing what's been going on in recent months with Syria, with Russia, et cetera. You know, we're, we're they're, they're allied with, with places that have far too much control and... Right. Well, whoever controls the energy controls the people. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it be great if our foreign policy was, we don't need you. We don't need you for anything. We may help you if you, if you act correctly, if you do the right things and have your civil rights in order and things like that. But the fact that we put up with so much in the Middle East because we need what they have, mm -hmm. that's, that's not a balanced relationship. That's not a moral relationship. We have it under our feet. We have 300 years and the known reserves, 300 years worth of natural gas in this country right now. And it's only being developed in private lands. The federal government won't allow, won't allow it for, for extraction in federal lands. It's ridiculous. The Keystone Pipeline is another, yeah. is another, it's a glaring, blaring sign of, you know, talk about being obstructionist. Yes, make it happen for crying out loud because the money's just going to go up to Canada. It's gonna go, or it's going to be transported on rail. Mm -hmm. And they had that big disaster in Quebec. 40 people died because of, you know, rail cars full of oil. There was an accident. People died. Mm -hmm. the safest way to move oil is through a pipeline. I know that obviously you differ from uh, Congressman Cartwright in terms of his stance on Obamacare. Um, one of the things that's near and dear to me as a military spouse uh, is that we, as a nation, make sure that American lives matter. I, it is my understanding that when the families of those killed in Benghazi were testifying before Congress, Congressman Cartwright walked out. was among people who right. walked out. Right. Now he claims he had somewhere else to be, some other vote. I have trouble digesting as a military spouse and as an American, what could possibly be more important than that? What about the dignity of the people who gave their lives? Yes. Is that worth being 15 minutes late? Because those people are going to be late forever. They're never going to be able to say good night or good morning the next day. Never. And this guy doesn't even have the, the common decency to stay, wait for it to be dismissed, and then move on. They can wait for him there. Mm -hmm. No, but it, sh it shows it shows who he is. It shows where his soul is. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's and that's interesting because when I I had always heard, even though he and I, which we discussed, were polar opposites in terms of our political views. I'm obviously much more aligned with you, being a conservative, and and I always heard, but he's a nice guy. But that act was not nice. Um, you don't walk out on parents. Aren't you of people judged who by your actions, not by your words? He also claims to be pro-life. He's not. Okay. He's got a 0% approval by the pro-life people. And he's got 100% by Planned Parenthood. But he said he was pro-life because part of the new district is full of Catholics in Scranton. Now, as a Catholic from Northampton County, I get it. I get how some people say, oh, well, he's pro-life and it's okay. No, no, no. You, you, have to, you have to walk the walk. Right. You can't just talk it. Mm -hmm.